We spent much of the last video introducing black holes and specifically the concept of a Schwarzschild black hole. In this video, we're going to go into more depth with our discussion on the Schwarzschild black hole. Let's start by recalling the Schwarzschild metric. Remember that the line element for a spherically symmetric space-time geometry is the following. I'll call this equation 1. Note that r sub s is the Schwarzschild radius as shown here, and that the coordinates corresponding to this line element are defined as follows. Recall also from my last video that the proper time interval perceived by an observer really far away from our mass m, tau infinity, is related to the proper time interval experienced by someone at a radial coordinate r by the following equation. This is my equation for gravitational time dilation in Schwarzschild geometry, and I'll call this equation 2. And finally, recall again from my last video that the frequency of waves emitted at the radial coordinate r is related to the frequency of those waves perceived at infinity by the following equation. This is the equation for gravitational redshift in Schwarzschild geometry, and I'll call this equation 3. Let's now draw a diagram where we've got our black hole. The center of that black hole is our radial coordinate r equals 0 over here, and the radial coordinate r equals r sub s is here. Now this threshold at the r sub s radial coordinate has a special name. It's called the event horizon of the black hole. Let's also suppose that we have an observer A who is fixed at infinity and that we also have the observer's twin B who isn't fixed but starts out at infinity and then travels in a straight radial path towards the event horizon. Suppose that while observer B is traveling towards the event horizon, he's consistently clapping once every second. So the proper time between claps in B's reference frame is one second. Now as observer B continues to travel straight towards the event horizon, the time between his claps is one second in his reference frame. So when B is at some radial coordinate R, the proper time between claps tau sub R is still one second. However, according to observer A at infinity, the time between B's claps gets dilated or increased according to B's position. So tau sub A or tau sub infinity according to our gravitational time dilation equation in equation 2 is actually increased by a factor given by this square root. So as B approaches the event horizon, the time between each of B's claps gets longer and longer according to observer A because this denominator gets smaller and smaller. Eventually when B gets really close to the event horizon, the time between each clap will get so prolonged according to observer A that it'll be as if observer B is frozen in time. This is our first conclusion. Let's now look at another aspect of B's journey. Suppose that on his journey towards the black hole, B shines a blue light throughout his journey towards A. In B's reference frame, the frequency of this blue light, F sub R, remains the same throughout the journey, so the blue light will still look blue according to B. So when B is at a radial coordinate R, the frequency of the light is still the same value of F sub R. But according to A, as B gets closer and closer to the event horizon, the frequency f sub r should be more and more redshifted. So it'll go from being a blue light at the start to a green light and then a red light, then an infrared wave, microwave, radio wave, and so on. Of course, the equation governing this redshift is the following, which we've already discussed. You can see from this equation that as observer B gets closer to the event horizon, the frequency of the light that B shines approaches zero according to observer A, so there will come a point in B's journey that A will no longer be able to detect B because the electromagnetic waves coming from B are so redshifted that they're just no longer detectable. This is our second conclusion. So we can see from conclusions 1 and 2 that as observer B approaches the event horizon, there will come a point in his journey that observer B will become frozen in time and will also become so redshifted that he'll virtually be invisible to A. And that's why we can't see anything in or even near a black hole, because as an object gets closer to the event horizon, the object gets redshifted so much that it virtually becomes undetectable. But even if we could somehow reverse the redshift, we'll never actually see the object cross the event horizon, because by the time it gets close, it's just going to appear frozen in time because of gravitational time dilation, at least according to our external reference frame. Now here's another question you might have. Why do we call it the event horizon? Well, let's assume that we now have two events, E1 and E2, that are infinitesimally separated in our Schwarzschild geometry. The space-time separation or distance between these two events is given by our ds squared from equation 1. To simplify things, let's assume that E1 and E2 occur at the same value of theta and phi, so there's only a time separation and a radial separation. 
Now let's recall some facts from special relativity. If E1 and E2 are time-like separated, then this would mean that our df squared is negative. If we're outside the event horizon, this implies that the time separation term, the dt term, overpowers the spatial separation term, which results in a negative df squared, and hence time-like separation. If they're light-like separated, that means the ds squared between E1 and E2 is zero. And if they're space-like separated, that means ds squared is positive. This means that outside the event horizon, the spatial separation or dr term overpowers the time separation term, resulting in a positive ds squared and hence space-like separation. So if we're outside the event horizon, then E1 and E2 are time-like separated if the dt term is larger in magnitude than the dr term. They're space-like separated if the dr term is larger. But if we're inside the event horizon, things change dramatically. That's because inside the event horizon, if we look at our ds squared equation, r will now be less than r sub s, so the term in the parentheses will now take on negative values. So inside the event horizon, if the dt term overpowers the dr term, our ds squared will actually be positive. If the dr term overpowers the dt term, our ds squared will be negative. This is the opposite of what we see outside the event horizon. As soon as we go inside the event horizon, events that ordinarily would be space-like separated now become time-like separated, and events that would ordinarily be time-like separated now become space-like separated. Another way of conceptualizing this is that time becomes space and space becomes time when we cross the event horizon. And that's why it's called the event horizon. The fundamental nature of our events changes as we cross r sub s, hence the name event horizon. So at this point, we've discussed a number of properties of the Schwarzschild black hole and provided some intuition about what happens near such a black hole with respect to time, frequency, and the nature of events. But our discussions mainly focused on physical objects or observers and how they behave near the event horizon. And that's why for the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about how light behaves as it approaches the event horizon. So let's draw a vertical t-axis for our coordinate time and a horizontal r-axis for our radial coordinate. This will be our space-time diagram for this discussion. The event horizon is here, labeled at r equals r sub s. Let's now suppose that we have a ray of light that is fired towards the event horizon from infinity at the time of zero, so really, really far away from the event horizon. Let's also suppose that the ray of light is fired in the radial direction only, so d theta and d phi are both zero. Now, because we're talking about light, the path that light follows must naturally be a light-like separated path, meaning that every point in that path must be light-like separated from other points, and this would then correspond to a ds squared of zero. As a result, we went from the Schwarzschild line element in equation 1 to an equation that just relates the dt to the dr, because ds squared is zero. If we rearrange this equation and take the square root of both sides, we end up with a first order differential equation describing dt by dr. The plus minus is out there because we took the square root. I'll call this equation four. Now equation four basically gives you the slope of the light cones for different values of r. The area inside the light cones is the only area that is physically traversable by any object, and that's because nothing can locally, meaning in its immediate reference frame, travel faster than light. This fact, by the way, comes from combining the postulates of special relativity with the equivalence principle. If we look at light cones really far away from the event horizon, which correspond to the limit that r approaches infinity, we see that those light cones have a slope of plus or minus 1 over c. And when we create a system of units where c is 1, which we can do by assuming that time is measured in light meters, or the time it takes for light to travel 1 meter, then the slope reduces to plus or minus 1. And this slope of plus or minus 1 is consistent with the slope of the light cones we see in flat Minkowski space in special relativity. So this is all making sense so far. When you're far away from the event horizon from the black hole, you basically have a flat Minkowski space when you're that far away. However, if we look at light cones closer to the event horizon, then that means our dt by dr now approaches infinity, so the light cones now become narrower and narrower with the lines virtually becoming vertical as we approach the event horizon. So what this implies is that because mass-containing objects can only travel in space-time within their light cone, those mass-containing objects are restricted to this really narrow region. In fact, when we're almost touching the event horizon, those mass-containing objects and even light hardly move. From this point of view, light never actually approaches the event horizon because it freezes by the time it gets really close. 
But is it actually true then that nothing ever crosses the event horizon, that everything freezes before it gets there? Well, not quite. It only appears this way to someone who's out at infinity. The reason it appears this way is our choice of coordinate system. In our conventional coordinate system, we use t to represent the time coordinate. And remember from my last video that this t coordinate in the Schwarzschild metric is directly related to the proper time, but the proper time experienced by someone out at infinity. But the proper time at infinity is irrelevant when it comes to objects near the event horizon, so it's natural that our t coordinate misrepresents what actually happens to an object traveling near r sub s, because it only depicts the perspective of someone who's really far away. And so this is why we need a different coordinate system if we are to more accurately describe what happens to objects crossing the event horizon, but I'll go over that in a future video. Anyway, we talked about what the light cones look like as they approach the event horizon from the outside, but what about light cones on the inside of the event horizon? Well, equation 4, which I've rewritten here, is still true. However, inside the horizon, the light cones are now rotated by 90 degrees to look like this, where they open to the left instead of light cones opening upwards. The reason for this goes back to our discussion about events inside the event horizon. Remember that space-like separated events outside the horizon become time-like separated events inside the horizon, and if the light cone encloses the set of possible time-like separated events from the cone's vertex, the cone's tip, then it should be pretty clear that the light cone has to be facing left when we're inside the event horizon. Another way of thinking about this is that inside the event horizon, the spatial coordinate takes on the properties of the time coordinate and vice versa. So the r axis basically becomes the time axis inside r sub s, while the time axis becomes the r axis. So with this new axis orientation, the light cones must obviously go from opening to the top on the outside to now opening up to the left on the inside of the event horizon. And because the light cones now open up to the left, this means that all objects inside the event horizon, and that includes light, all of these objects and light are all moving towards the singularity, towards r equals zero. It is not possible for anything to escape the black hole because all possible paths lead to its center, and that is fundamentally what defines a black hole. Nothing, not even light, can escape once you're inside it, and we see that here mathematically. Anyway, that should do it for this video. There were quite a few concepts to explain here, but hopefully it all made sense. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.